Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, today I am answering a number of your requests for me to take a look at the channel Possible History. So here we are. He's a history student doing mostly alternate history. And what I notice is that he's got 98,500 subscribers, which means he's right on the cusp of that 100,000 mark, which is a big deal for uh, YouTube creators because it means you get that silver play button, which is an acknowledgement of your progress. So I think with the nearly 400,000 subscribers we have on this channel, there's no reason that in the first 24 hours we can't push him over. So please, if you like what you see and what we react to today, please go check him out. Watch some of his videos. I'm showing some of the stuff he's got here because we're going to decide which one we're going to choose. Uh, and if it goes really well, we might do another one. Uh, so he is at 98,500. Let's get him over 100,000. I think we're going to take a look at changing the map back to 1914. That one looks really interesting to me. And it says, what if we had 1914 borders in the modern world? So that's the one we're going to look at today. It's right here. You can see some of the other ones that are available. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Inga. Inga, I don't know where you're from. It doesn't show up on uh, my information, but uh, thank you. And Patrick from Lithia Springs, Georgia. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. If you want to become a, a supporter of this channel through Patreon, it makes a big, big difference. And it's going to have a, a lot of input in what we do here in the very near future. So uh, you can check out the link in the description or on the screen there. You see it to become a supporter today. Let's dive in. We will be changing the borders of the world back to 1914, reforming the nations that existed at the time while leaving the world as it is today in terms of population and economy. Exploring some of the internal economic and population changes of these new nations and comparing the reformed central powers and Entente in terms of population and GDP. So let's start remaking the map and to start off with a bang. So uh, before we get into this, why 1914? Well, 1914 is the year that the Great War, World War I breaks out. Uh, it's a really good divergence point for looking at alternate history when we talk about alternate history and i realize not everybody's into that sort of thing but i think it's a fantastic way of analyzing what really did happen by kind of playing out the scenarios of how those choices and those actions determined the future of the world uh, so 1914 is a great place to diverge because the great war changed so much of the landscape and honestly everything that has happened since uh, could be completely different if the events of 1914 go differently so i'm very curious to see where he goes with this the emergence of the british empire this massive continent spanning empire used to be arguably the most powerful nation on earth in 1940. For the sakes of this comparison, I have included the British dominions in my calculations for the British Empire. And obviously, so uh, Canada at this point is kind of semi-autonomous. I mean, obviously, we're talking about a lot of areas that are directly under British control, but then others who are more loosely tied in terms of economics and having the same head of state, which, for example, Canada still has, right? Canada still has King Charles III as their head of state, but they have really a separate government, a separate military. They're separate in every way except for those political and economic ties that are much looser now. Obviously, the UK grows massively in power as a result of the added nations. The British GDP goes from 3 trillion all the way up to 15 trillion, increasing by fivefold. This increased GDP is mainly driven by the inclusion of India, obviously, which alone doubles the British GDP, as well as the inclusion of the dominions of Canada and Australia, which together double it again. The so uh, India at this point uh, is actually uh, the the monarch in the UK, who at this point is King George V, is actually the Emperor of India. Uh, that's one of his titles that he has. The rest of the missing 5.5 trillion comes from the scattered colonies all across the world. The wealth inequality in this newly founded nation, however, would be staggering. Britain makes up 20% of GDP, while only holding 2% of the empire's population. Hmm. Britain and the Dominions make up a combined 50% of the empire's GDP, but they only hold 8% of the empire's population. That's interesting. Uh, and one thing, just kind of thinking ahead of how this is going to go, uh, I feel like uh, obviously Germany in 1914 doesn't have a lot of land in terms of the borders, but had they remained on the trajectory that they were on, if there's no great war, um, 
I feel like Germany and the UK kind of become the world superpowers rather than Russia and the United States or the Soviet Union and the United States. This means that the entire colonial empire of the Brits, 92% of the population, has an equal amount of GDP as the core and dominion regions. The population change for the UK is absolutely insane, as the total British population is increased by 40-fold, from around 67 million to 2.8 billion, easily becoming the most populous nation on earth. The well, yeah, because you figure India is the most populous nation on earth. I think they've passed China now. Yeah, I think they have. Uh, so that's a, like half of it right there, right? Um, Pakistan, Bangladesh, these are very populous nations. The vast majority nations. of this population, almost 2 billion, live on the Indian subcontinent. Wow. With another half a billion in Britain's vast African empire, primarily in Nigeria. Next up, we reform the German Empire, giving Germany these great European borders as well as a colonial empire again. The German population triples from 80 million to 230 million. But Germany's GDP is barely affected, changing from 4.2 trillion to 4.7 trillion. By far, the bulk of Germany's population now lives in Africa with 55% in their colonies. Just like with the British, however, we can see the great disparity in economy and population. 60% of the German population lives in their colonies, you know how much GDP this 60% accounts for? Wow. 4%. So see, in that case, what you're dealing with with Germany is a net negative, I would think, on their economy. Because uh, one of the main purposes for these colonies, for these European powers, was the generation of revenue. It's about the resources that are there and how they could exploit those resources for their own growth. In the British Empire, they are able to do that. In the German Empire, they've got a lot of people to deal with and feed and, and deal with infrastructure and all those sorts of things, but they're not seeing a return on the investment, so to speak. I understand how callous it sounds to describe it that way because we're talking about people. I'm just trying to look at it from that perspective. That's it. Modern Germany itself makes up about 85% of GDP, with Alsace and the Polish Corridor accounting for about 11%. Over in Asia... So what does he mean by Alsace? Well, Alsace and Lorraine is that area uh, in the eastern part of France that had kind of gone back and forth, and most recently at this point uh, had gone over to Germany as part of the settlement after the Franco-Prussian War. That was the war that led to the creation of the German Empire in the first place. Uh, but then you've got everything over here that would be part of modern-day Poland uh, and also um, parts of, well, I guess it's pretty much just Poland, but um, it looks like we haven't created the Austro-Hungarian Empire yet, but that's going to come. We restored a Japanese empire where we have the first time that colonial expansion significantly affects both population and GDP in a roughly proportional manner. Interesting. This makes sense. As Japan Korea. retakes the very developed economies of South Korea and Taiwan, making Japan's GDP go up from 5 trillion up to 7.5, a massive 50% jump. Me now, I understand and I, and I recognize this. Uh, it's not really the purpose of how he's doing this, that had those places been under control of those nations from 1914 to today, those things look very different, right? South Korea's GDP probably isn't what it is if it's under Japan the whole time. But he's not kind of taking it to that level. He's just kind of looking at the territory, how it looks today, and if it went back to the people that it was originally under 100 years ago. Meanwhile, Japan's population goes from 125 million up to 230 million, an 80% jump. Within this new empire, Japanese people would make up about 55% of the population, South Koreans about 22%, North Koreans about 11%, mm. and Taiwanese about 10%. I didn't realize that South Korea's population was that much higher than North Korea's, but it makes sense uh, with the poverty that has existed, particularly in North Korea, uh, making it much harder for population explosion obviously you're not having the immigration that you would have in other places in terms of gdp the story is not that different we just essentially remove north korea since their gdp is negligible let's now do the most powerful nation on earth today the united states the united states essentially only re-annexes the philippines but even that is a massive change in population mm. adding 100 million people to the american umbrella a 35% change for the nation. 
This change comes coupled, however, with perhaps the most disappointing change in GDP. The American GDP goes from 23.3 trillion to 23.7, a whopping 2% change, showing just how enormous the American economy is. Yeah. This also yeah, that's means less of a reflection on the Philippines and more of a reflection of just on the, the vast wealth that the United States has. That despite the British having their gigantic empire restored, the British are still almost 8 trillions behind the Americans in terms of GDP. Does this mean that the British take the second place to the Americans? No, not even. Since China, which loses the bet but gains Mongolia, barely changed their GDP or population figures, meaning they still have a GDP of almost 18 trillion, putting the massive reformed British Empire, which literally has double the population that China has, behind China in terms of GDP. Now and again, uh, as we look back, if we're talking about a divergence in history, for the next 100 years after 1914, does the United States grow the way that it does? Because things like World War I and World War II are two of the great um, kind of uh, factors that really spur on the U.S. economy to become this world superpower, both economically and also militarily. Uh, if Britain's got that much more territory, it makes sense that there may be a massive shift in how its economy grows. So there's no way we can factor that in, though. To round off the list of top five GDPs in this new world, there is Japan at the number four spot, and finally, Germany at the number five. And do See, you I think in a situation where Germany is left where it is in 1914, that changes. I think you end up with Germany as one of the top two or three world superpowers. Want to know a fun thing about this top five? Despite all the changes made on the map so far, only one nation has really changed in the relative rankings, the British, who by virtue of annexing India, jump from 6th in the world to 3rd. But back mm. to the map, we have the reformed Russian Empire, enlarging what was already the largest nation on earth. The Russian GDP, after a change, almost doubles from 1.7 trillion up to 3 trillion, while their population more than doubles from 140 million up to 320 mm. million. The vast majority of this population consists of the Eastern Slavs of Russia, Ukraine and Belarus, with a significant 22% of the population living in Central Asia. In terms of GDP to population ratio, Russia is one of the more equal changed nations, with the 60% of Eastern Slavs making up 65% of the GDP. Next up, we have the colonial empire of France, with its core around their West African mm. possessions. France follows. See, a lot of that, though, is the desert. It's the Sahara. So uh, you're not, you know, the territory there can be deceiving because a lot of the center of this, there's just not a lot going on there. The by now classic European colonial story. Their population is increased by an insane seven and a half times, from 76 million up to 515. But their GDP only changes by a mere 35%. And so there's another great example of. Um, you're looking at, what, a 700% increase in population, but only a 35% increase in GDP. Uh, that would probably be unsustainable. From 3 trillion up to 4 trillion. So, while in terms of GDP, the new empire is centered around France itself, in terms of population, European France only makes up around 13%, with by far most of the empire's population living in Africa. A large 25% lives in French Indochina, and the remaining population... French Indochina, what are we talking about? Like Vietnam, for example, that Southeast Asia area there. ...lives in North Africa and Arabia. This makes the French a massive minority within their own new empire. Next up is a nation whose giant shift may not be expected by most, especially since they kept out of World War I entirely. This nation is the Netherlands. Oh, Netherlands. The relative difference between the Netherlands and Indonesia is about the same as between Britain and India. Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, the Netherlands, you're going to add Indonesia, which is one of the most populous nations on Earth. Yeah. The small nation of the Netherlands houses around 17 million people. Indonesia holds 270 million. The Dutch population therefore skyrockets, becoming 17 times larger. GDP is also heavily affected, although nowhere near as much as the population hmm. figures may suggest. The Dutch economy moved from 1 trillion up to around 2.2 trillion. This makes the reformed Dutch Empire unique, as their colonies don't just dominate the reformed state in terms of population, 
but Indonesia also has a larger GDP than the Netherlands themselves. Yeah. Obviously, the division of GDP is still very disproportionate, but it does make the Netherlands the only one to be dominated in terms of GDP and population by their colonial empire. Next up, we have Italy, which gets a couple of minor colonies in Africa back, which, for the Italian economy, is nearly completely unnoticeable, as their economy grows by a whopping 2%. Wow. This is unsurprising, as Italy only annexed the minor Eritrea, unstable Somalia, and Libya. All three you gotta remember, Italy has not, I mean, of course, Germany hasn't been a country that long either. Italy and Germany are kind of the noobs on the European stage, right? Both countries are formed in the 19th century, uh, and, and so they are kind of behind the ball when it comes to uh, the expansion that nations like France and the British are able to accomplish. Uh, so you can see how that's reflected uh, things. Of course, Belgium does a lot too, and Belgium has only been a country a few decades longer than Italy and Germany have been. Areas having relatively small populations and being much less developed than Italy itself. Still, Italy's population grows by about 40%, from 60 million up to 85 million, with about a third of Italy's population now residing in Africa, mostly in Somalia. To finish off the reformed colonial empires, we have Portugal and Belgium. Portugal annexes Mozambique and Angola, increasing the Portuguese population by more than 10 times, wow. from 10 million... This just goes to show you just how many people are in some of these African nations, right? We don't think about that very often because they're not talked about a lot in the news, right? Uh, but, you know, some of these countries are just massive in terms of the number of people they have. And if they can ever really get their economies going, they can become major players on the world stage. Up to 105 million. The Portuguese economy changes by about 60%, growing from 250 billion to 400 billion. By far, most of the Portuguese population now resides in Africa, with 90% of the population now living in the African colonies. In the case of Belgium, we have the small nation taking over the Congo in Central Africa, increasing their GDP by an enormous 9%, while their population increases by tenfold wow. from 11 million up to 110 million. And Belgian Congo is one of those classic examples that we talk about in history of how a European power exploits and in some ways brutalizes a colony. Uh, Belgian Congo is kind of the poster boy for that. It's not the only one, and I don't want to single out Belgium, but that was particularly brutal. The GDP and population percentages of Belgium are almost inverse, as 90% of the economy is in Europe, while 90% of the population resides in the Congo. With this, we conclude the important changed colonial empires. Most of these followed a pattern which surprised me greatly. Despite absolutely massive changes in population, GDP numbers were very under-affected. The only European economies that doubled in size were Britain and the Netherlands, and even then, Britain's economy growing by five times doesn't reflect the jump their population right. made, increasing by more than 4,000%. Obviously, I always knew about the poor economic state of most of the world when compared to the West, but comparing these GDP to population changes for the Europeans makes it seem absolutely crazy. That's actually a really good point that he makes there, and this is an interesting way to compare the two, right? To add the population and the GDP and see the differences that it makes. It, it does really show you, and listen, I'm not somebody who spends a lot of time talking about uh, things like wealth inequality, and honestly, I'm not an economist anyway, um, but that is a really, really interesting thing to note about the modern world. But we have two more important empires to reform before we're done. First, we have the Ottoman Empire, mm. which extends itself into and Arabia, yeah. doubling the Turkish population from 85 million up to 175 million. Unlike the European colonial empires, the Turkish economy pretty much follows the same trend, growing from 820 billion up to 1.5 trillion, nearly doubling as well. This means that the Ottomans are one of the select few where economy and population grow in equal measure. Then finally, we have the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is, percentually, one of the most affected nations. Oh, I bet. If we count modern Austria as the nation to compare from, their economy triples from 500 billion up to 1.5 trillion. And let me say, having just spent several days in Austria last week, 
one of my favorite countries I've ever been to. Austria was amazing. Vienna is an incredible city. I was only there for a couple of days, but one of my favorite cities I've ever been to. Oh my gosh, the history there. Can't wait to bring you the videos from that tour. Austria is a beautiful place. The people were fantastic. Loved everything about it. Well, their population grows from 9 million up to 60 million. Within this reformed Austrian Empire, the central Slavs of Czechia, Slovakia and southern Poland make up 40% of their population, with Austrians themselves actually making up one of the smaller population hmm. groups and then the southern as the Slavs, Hungarians, Slavs. southern Slavs and Romanians. Yeah, and there used to be, I mean, when I was in, in middle school, we had a country called Yugoslavia, which is the South Slavs. Uh, so, yeah, Austria-Hungary was always this really weird amalgamation of very different groups of people. And uh, that would be a fascinating country to see existing today. Also outnumber the Austrians, even just barely. With this, we have mostly reforged the borders of 1914, focusing on the most important nations. Let's add the final couple minor changes, Spain. meaning we now have the full map of 1914. With these changed borders, though... How has the balance of power in the world shifted? Well, as discussed before, in terms of economy, the changes are disappointing. The US and China still top the number one and two spots respectively. The British, through annexing India, steer ahead of Japan and Germany. France and Russia are next, followed by the Dutch, who jump from the 17th in the world to the 8th, just slightly beating out Italy at number 9. Ending off the list is Brazil at number 10. The biggest changes in the rankings are simply from the disappearance of India and Canada, yeah. the number 5 and 9 economies respectively, into Britain. So those just got merged into Britain. And uh, and again, this none of this takes into account the uh, changes that might have happened in the 100 years since if those borders had remained. Moving all the nations below them up two places. While we're forming the two initial power blocks of great powers in 1914, the Entente and the Central Powers, we have a laughable comparison. The central powers have a population of... But that was the case even in 1914 when you compared the two. Uh, the, the great balancing factor in all of it was, of course, the military might of Germany that kind of kept them in the game for as long as they were. 300 million. The Entente? 3.6 billion. The central powers have an economy of 6 trillion. The Entente? 22 trillion. So, the Entente has the population edge by a multiplier of 12 and an economic advantage of 5 to 1. Removing Britain from the comparison, however, shows a starkly different picture. Hmm. Now, the Central Powers and Entente are almost equal in economy, with only a slight edge towards the Entente. And actually then, uh, I mean, if you keep Britain in but you remove the United States, because the US doesn't enter the war uh, until the third year of the war, uh, well, 1914, 15, 16, I mean, really kind of the three and a half years into the war. In terms of population, however, the Entente still outnumbers the Central Powers by almost four to one. Changing the teams to 1915, the Central Powers start to lose uh. even more ground. We now add Japan, China, and Italy to the Entente side. Well, so we haven't actually added the United States yet. That was just in 1914. All right. Central Powers only get Turkey added as a major power. The Central Powers are now outnumbered by 470 million to 5.3 billion. And Germany understood this, which is why they tried so hard to win a quick war, because they knew, much like Japan knew in World War II, that they couldn't win a long protracted war. When you're dealing with an economic and population powerhouse, they are going to tend to take a little longer to bring that full might to bear on you. And so if you can win a quick victory, then maybe you can negotiate a, a favorable settlement. A long-term situation only favors the more powerful, the more populous. For reference, that means that 70% of humanity is in a nation that has sided with the Entente. This has also made the difference in economy much, much greater, with 8 trillion against 50. The final nail in the central powers coffin yes. comes when we shift the teams to 1917. Sure, no, Russia Russia's drops out. out for the Entente, but in exchange, they gained the United States. This man and this is an important factor in World War One, right? Because uh, Russia is knocked out of the war because of their revolutions and their internal upheaval, which is happening in a lot of countries, but worse in Russia. Um, and, and so Germany's going to take 
50 or so divisions from the Eastern Front rush them over to the West, and they're going to try to win a quick victory. Uh, they're going to try to split the British and the French, who are the primary uh, armies on the Western Front. There's others before the United States can really bring significant arms to bear. Massively increases the Entente economic dominance, as the Entente now has an economy worth 70 trillion meaning the Entente now controls more than 75% of the world's economy. Nice. To conclude, let's look at the relative world's population. In number one, by a wide margin, we have the British Empire with 2.8 billion people, meaning 35% of the world's population crazy. now lives within this reformed British Empire. In second place, we have China with 1.4 billion. Jumping down by a billion, we have France in third, sporting 480 million people. The US with 450 in 4th, Russia with 220 in 5th, and then we have a, for me, surprise contender. The Netherlands manages to beat out both Germany and Japan as the 6th most populous state on earth. Hmm. Rounding off the list, we have Brazil in 9th place and the Ottomans in 10th place. But with that, I will end the video here. I hope you all enjoyed, I might try to do something similar with 1939, or maybe like 1950, but I don't know how different most of my conclusions would be, yeah. as the border changes are relatively minor when comparing 1914 to 1939. Another idea I have is... So that was pretty fascinating. Um, like I said, there are a bunch of different videos on there. If there's a particular one you'd like me to take a look at, I'd be glad to do that. Let's see if we can push him over 100,000 subscribers here in the next day or two. Would love to see that happen. I want to give a shout out to Jaden in uh, Rattan, Oklahoma, uh, and Brock in Mishawaka, Indiana. I probably butchered both of those names. I apologize. Thank you guys so much for your support on Patreon. Check out some other videos here. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.